Let me tell you a, a little bit about them before I, I have him on and we start talking and chatting. We're going to be talking a lot about evolution. Uh, he's, a, he's a very famous scientist. He's a sy synthetic organic chemist. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from Syracuse University. He has a PhD in synthetic organic and organometallic chemistry. I don't even know what that is, but we're going to find out from Purdue University and postdoctoral training in synthetic organic chemistry at the University of Wisconsin and Stanford University. After spending 11 years on the faculty of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of South Carolina, he joined the Center for Nanoscale Science and Technology at Rice University in 1999. And he's presently professor of chemistry, professor of computer science, professor of material science and nano engineering. Okay, and I'm not done yet. He has over 600 research publications, over 120 patents, with total citations over 69,000. That's on Google Scholar. He was inducted into the National Academy of Inventors in 2015. He was named among the 50 most influential scientists in the world today by thebestschools.org. In 2014, he's listed in the world's most influential scientific minds by Thomas Reuters, sciencewatch.com in 2014. And he was named Scientist of the Year by R&D Magazine in 2013. That is a whole lot of credentials. Dr. Tor, thank you so much for being on the air today. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, there's something else that if you're listening and you're a science-oriented person, you might be surprised to know. Um, he's skeptical and critical of Darwinian evolution, and he's also uh, very much a Bible-believing Christian. He reads the Bible every day and consults God on a regular basis for God's will in his life, and he also teaches a weekly Bible study. So, uh, Dr. Tor, can you start us from the beginning? Um, you weren't always a Christian. Can you take us back to the beginning when you were a kid, and, and were you thinking at a, a young age, I, I want to get into uh, nanoscience and these sorts of things? Well, no, no, not when I was young, nanoscience. That was, uh, the term wasn't even used. Hmm. Um, no, I, I grew up in a, in a Jewish home. Uh, I was born in New York City, grew up in a Jewish home just outside the city. And uh, um, it wasn't until I was, was uh, 18 and I was at college that I had first heard the gospel. Uh, I'm sure that, that I must have heard it at other times, mm -hmm. but it never really connected. And so, so what, what had happened is, is I, I, I uh, uh, wanted to always actually be a, a policeman and I couldn't get into the academy. I was going to try to become a New York State trooper. I couldn't get into the academy because I was colorblind, so I decided to get my degree in forensic science. And my father, uh, when I was 17, had told me, why don't you just major in chemistry and then you can uh, you can specialize in forensics after you get your degree and I followed his advice and so I was 18 I went off to college as a chemistry major and that's when I first heard the gospel um, now you, uh, you heard the gospel at a, at a university correct now what yeah. what how did that happen did some a friend share the gospel with you or what happened yeah, it was it was a, a young man who lived there on on the dormitory floor with me, and and uh, he was with the Navigators Campus Ministry, and he he and I were in in the in the laundry room doing laundry in in August of my freshman year, and uh, he said I'd like to give you an illustration of the gospel because we had gotten to speaking, and I asked him what he wanted to do when he graduated. He had played some football at Syracuse, and I asked him if he wanted to play pro ball when he graduated and he told me oh no I'm not good enough for that I said what do you want to do he said lay ministry and I didn't know what lay ministry meant yeah. <laughs> and I said you know what what is that he said oh sort of like a missionary and I thought you don't need missionaries today you got TV <laughs> um, uh, why would you need a missionary and so he, he, he asked if he could give me an illustration of the gospel and and a day or two later he came up to my room and, and uh, uh, he drew out the, the bridge illustration of man on one side and God on the other side and sin separating us man from God and I I had asked him um, I mean and then he had me read verse out of Romans where it says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and I said to him I'm not a sinner and he looked at me a bit strange and <laughs> and and you know we don't dwell on sin in modern secular Judaism yeah um, you go to the synagogue once a year and, and you're good to go and and you just don't think about it a whole lot. And, and he looked at me a bit strangely, but then he had me read a verse 
out of out of uh, Matthew's gospel where where Jesus said, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. Yeah. And I that really hit me. And the reason it hit me so hard is I was addicted to pornography. Wow. I had worked in a gas station since the age of 14 along the, the Hutchison River Parkway uh-huh. and uh, uh, just outside of New York City. And I I had uh, picked up magazines from the parking lots on Friday nights when the salesmen would throw them out on their way home. And uh, I became addicted at a young age, and I didn't think anybody knew about this, and Jesus knew. And it, I was just exposed by the words of this man from 2,000 years ago. Mm. And so it hit me much harder than you, it might hit somebody else. And, yeah. And, and all of a sudden, I looked at him and I said, well, if this is the definition of sin, then I am a sinner. And that was my first realization that I was a sinner, because I'd said to him, I haven't robbed a bank, I haven't killed anyone, how could I be a sinner? Yeah. And so now I realized I was. And then um, I started meeting a lot of, of, of Christians that at the time that the common term used was, a, was born again Christians. Jimmy Carter was president and mm. he had said that he was a born again Christian. And, and uh, I started meeting really nice people and I was, I was impressed by them, particularly impressed. They invite me to sit with them at, in the cafeteria. And I noticed that when they were laughing, they weren't laughing at anybody. Mm. They, they were just enjoying one another. Yeah. And and uh, so there was much more wholesomeness in their laughter. And usually if a group was laughing, they were laughing at somebody. And all of us have experienced that pain of having groups of people laugh at us. And it's never a pleasant feeling. And so, so I attended a Bible study taught by the navigators there on my college floor for a couple of months. And then I was all alone in my room. Now it was November 7th of 1977 and I got down on my knees and I'm not even sure what motivated me to do that because modern Judaism you you stand when you pray and in in Christians that I had met were sitting when they were praying and so but anyway I was down on my knees and I asked Jesus to forgive me and to come into my life and uh, and he did he did that that moment as soon as I prayed that prayer it was as if I started to feel this burden of sin lift from my shoulders and then all of a sudden someone was in my room and my roommate was not there and and the door was closed and someone was standing in my room and I and I opened my eyes and and I couldn't see anybody but the presence of Jesus was so real that I just started weeping and it wasn't I wasn't scared I was just enjoying this presence and uh, of forgiveness and friendship and something that I had never known. Um, and I, I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't want to get up from that moment. And finally, you know, it was over and I, I didn't want to tell anybody. I mean, what's this Jewish kid from New York City going to say? Yeah. <laughs> and so he saw me on the floor. The, the young man that had shared with me saw me on the floor a couple of weeks later. And he said, Jim, if you ask Jesus in your heart, I said, I think I have. Why do you ask? He says, you haven't stopped smiling for weeks. <laughs> And I knew that I was different. I mean, my whole attitude on life, I had had a lot of teen suicide thoughts, as many teens think about it. I never tried it, but yeah. but things changed so much after that. And I, I, and I asked him, how can I remain with this closeness to God? I've never known this before. He said, he said he's talked to people who kind of drifted away and he's talked to people who, who remain very close to God. And and those who remain close to God were reading their Bible every day. And those who, who kind of drifted away, they, they confessed that they had not been reading their Bible every day when he asked them. And so I said, okay, I can do that. I can read my Bible every day. And so I started on a pattern of reading the scriptures shortly after that, reading the scriptures every day of my life. And I started in Genesis chapter one, and I would read my way through to, to, uh, Revelation chapter 22, and then when I was done, I start again, and so I've been doing that for 40 years, Wow! and um, uh, and so I, I have this pattern of, of reading the scriptures in that way, but mm. it's very slow and pensive. I'm never in a hurry. I'm not trying to get through the Bible in a year. I, I will spend sometimes weeks in, in a few paragraphs, just just until I feel saturated from that portion. Uh, One of the most uh, incredible scientists in the world who almost became a policeman, who was was pursuing uh, the police academy uh, before he got into uh, science, and he is 
was uh, selected as one of the most influential scientists in the world today by bestschools.org. And um, Dr. Tor, I, before I interrupted you, you were talking about how your, your friend said that the way he's seen somebody stay close to the Lord was by staying in the Word. And do you think that this is a, an issue that Christians today uh, struggle with is, or don't understand is staying in the Word? Yeah, but it, 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 I mean, the scriptures are filled with, 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 with the admonition. I mean, Paul, uh, um, Moses told Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, mm-hmm. but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. And then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. It's, it, says, it's, it says something very similar in Psalm 1. Psalm 112, verse 1 and 2. The scriptures are filled with this sort of admonition. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, the last things that, 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 that Moses are teaching is, is that, we, that, that this, this is not an idle word for us. It is our life. And the, the, the pattern in scriptures is rarely reading. It is like in Psalm 119, verse 97 through 100. It is meditating on the word of God. And the scriptures put it in two ways. You meditate either daily or it'll say day and night Mm. so it's very specific it is every day of our lives and the blessing the promises that come are for daily meditation on the on the scriptures there is no promise that i've ever seen in scriptures for 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 meditating on the scriptures three days a week Mm. or five days a week it is for every day and that's amazing dr tor what's the difference between meditating on the word of god and just reading the word of god so reading the Word of God is, is, is an academic exercise that you can just go through and you can just plow right through and you can get through the Bible in a year quite easily doing that. Mm. Meditation is that you, you, you pick up this passage and you say, Lord, speak to me through this. Speak to me. And then you start to read slowly. And, and sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll get through many paragraphs without anything particular jumping out. And then, and it, but you're, you're, you're thinking about what's happening here, what's happening, and, and you're saying, Lord, speak to me through this. And then all of a sudden you come on a passage and your eyes can't get past it. Mm. And the Lord just starts to show you new things. And you say, oh, I've never seen this before. Well, but Dr. Tor, Dr. Tor, I've been reading through Chronicles, and uh, the beginning of Chronicles is just all these people's names. And uh, so what do you say to somebody who says, man, how do I get through this and uh, get something out of it? Uh, do I just push through, or what? What do you say then? Well, you, you, so so so. First of all, this, this sort of thing where you just see name after name after name yeah. is in a very small portion of the Bible, probably less than three percent. So okay, you're in this very small portion of the Bible where it has that, and yes, you can just push through. But the more you understand the scriptures, the more your eyes will get stopped in those passages, and you'd say, "Oh, I remember this guy. I remember reading about him." And and uh, and then you will see. Oh, I didn't know that was his father, and that was his grandfather. Mm-hmm. And look at his child. I mean, th- you see the obedience and what happened to his children, or the disobedience and what happened to his children. And you see the effects of this, where God said that that uh, um, that that these things will carry on from generation to generation. So there is life that can come out of it, but that that life gets more and more as you have a better foundation in the scripture. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Now, are you saying that, is this a supernatural blessing that comes from God where you're studying the scriptures and, and, you, and therefore you're, that obedience leads to a supernatural blessing? Or is this the blessing of, of understanding um, the scriptures and the principles taught there and, and they become more part of my life and so therefore I'm blessed in that regard? Both. Both, okay. So... So I'm learning and also God is honoring or, or is uh, lifting me up because I'm spending time in his word. Absolutely. And he promises to do that. In Psalm 112, it says, it, it says, praise the Lord. How blessed is man. Uh, it, it, praise the Lord. And then, it, then he talks about that this is what's going to happen if I delight in his word. And then ver- the, the next verse says, and his children will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. If I delight in the word of God, my children will be blessed on this earth. They will be mighty and they will be blessed on this earth. So, so the blessing is not just for us. It carries on to our children. The best thing that we can do for our children mm. is to meditate on the word of God, to love the word of God. Wow. That's a powerful message. And uh, is this kind of what you feel God has called you, or at least at this moment in time, has called you to 
uh, convey to the church, you know, to, to the, the pulpit he's given you is this, hey, we've got to get uh, back to meditating on God's word? Yeah, I, I, I tell people all the time. And when I teach the scriptures, I, I, I mean, people, I hope, hopefully will see something of passion in me that says in the scriptures that, that, that your word is like fire and like a hammer, which breaks the stone. The disciples on the road to Emmaus told, spoke about Jesus after he had appeared to them and then disappeared. He says, they said, were not our hearts burning within us when he was explaining the scriptures to us, when he was speaking to us along the way? Mm. This is what the scriptures will do. It will cause your heart to burn within you. And, and the message is there for everybody. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, it says that, that they received the same message but it was of no value to them because they did not combine it with faith. Mm. So there is a message here that we must combine with faith in order for it to have value in our lives. And I'll, I'll tell this to whoever will listen. Well, so, so here, this, this brings up a question. I mean, you're somewhat infamous uh, as a scientist with such incredible credentials. In, that, infamous? Well, infamous in the sense that you're skeptical of evolution. Uh, oh, okay. okay. You, yeah, not infamous as in a bad guy or anything. <laughs> so, but you, but um, you, you've kind of developed a reputation as somebody mm -hmm. who's who questions evolution. You, I believe you had an offer at one time. Hey, anybody who's willing to talk to me and give me actual evidence that evolu Darwinian evolution is true. Um, so some people are saying... Well, you've got to have faith, but you're such an evidence-based person because you, you work in the science fields. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of questions there. How does that all work together? And why are you so skeptical of uh, evolutionary theory? 